Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Railway Mania Podcast. Subscribers to the YouTube channel may have already seen the special episode where I sat down with Andy, Phil, Howard and Debbie from the World of Railways team. This is the full one hour chat where we discuss not only the virtual model rail exhibition they are putting on over the weekend of 7th and 8th of November 2020, but also exhibition etiquette, what we are missing from the circuit during the coronavirus pandemic and what the future might hold for exhibitions. So there will be a little repetition of the special episode, especially towards the beginning and the end, but I hope you find the whole chat interesting and I look forward to chatting with the team again. Hi, I'm Andy York. Uh, people probably know me most of all from uh, RM Web activities. But the other role that I play within BRM is photographer. Uh, that's on the uh, layout side, plus the uh, the products for reviews. I'm Phil Parker. I on, on BRM, I take the things that are in pieces and stick them back together again. And I also edit Garden Rail magazine. I'm Debbie Wood. I'm the, the brand content manager for um, for BRM and across the railways portfolio. I keep these boys in check and uh, yeah, just make sure everything goes out. Hi, I'm Howard. I'm multimedia editor for BRM and uh, our recent startup website, World of Railways. Lovely. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming on a special Railway Mania show for the second World of Railways virtual exhibition of 2020. I thought we'd kick things off with a little bit of fun. This was Howard's idea. A bit of a debate. I want you to pick your favourite layout. What do you think is best in show? And you're going to have 60 seconds to put forward your case for why it's the best in show and no one can choose the same layout. Oh, <laughs> six, 60 seconds. Is, is that long enough? 60 seconds. I, f- I feel like this is a challenge. Howard, it's your idea, so I think you should go first. I'm I gonna feel honoured. S- okay. Start the clock. Are you ready? Okay, yes. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so we've got 20 layouts, more than 20 layouts in the show, but the one I've picked is Scorbitton. Uh, it's a layout that we featured in the um, February 2019 issue of the magazine. We've got some great pics of it coming up on the show, set in the Welsh Marches area, and uh, it's sort of a 1980s period, BR Blue, but the thing that I love about it is that I grew up uh, right next to where this is set, and some of the architecture that's depicted on this layout is absolutely fantastic, and it's got that Z factor, the height aspect. I know, 32 seconds, it's counting. What I love about it is the architecture. There's, there's sort of the red sandstone, there's the uh, black and white rendered uh, buildings and uh, lots and lots of brickwork, which is absolutely beautifully weathered. An interesting track plan and uh, there's plenty of activity and also little cameos. There's a guy here crossing a uh, pelican crossing, reading a newspaper, clearly taking his time. And there's a dude in a reliant scimitar with his head out of the window, clearly giving him something for his money. Stop. Oh, uh, right, okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's a strong case. It's a strong first case. Lots of details. I like it. I like it. I, I, it's one of those layouts. It's 20 foot by 11 foot. No, no, foot. you've had, I'm going you've on had your sessions. <laughs> sure. That's enough. <laughs> Here's um, why I'm right. <laughs> Andy, okay, you have got 60 seconds starting from now. My standout layout of the, uh, the show is Andrew Bartlett's Blue Ball Summit. Not only because it's 1970s BR Blue Diesel Hydraulics in the West Country, which is a bit of a fetish of mine anyway, uh, but beyond that, it's because it's N-Gage, but it doesn't look like it. When I first took some snaps of it, I sent them through to Howard. I said, oh, have a look at this. It's an O-Gage layout that I photographed yesterday. And he said, that's absolutely brilliant. I said, ah, tough news, mate. It's N-Gage. But Andrew's gone way beyond that. He was a very good modeler beforehand anyway with an EM gauge layout called Old Shore. But he went into N-Gage and thought, how do I make it better? Uh, and similarly to Howard's choice of Scorbitton with the Z factor, there's a lot of height to this layout with the fantastic viaduct scene with the uh, the village underneath. And he's chosen to keep going and make it as good as possible. Stop. <laughs> Just in there. Okay. <laughs> I think use of height is fantastic on that layout. Yeah, uh, it's something um, that a lot of layout owners don't don't always consider when you know you can you can always build up on a layout. That doesn't yeah. really usually that's not the problem in taking up space in a room. It's usually the width or the length. Exactly. But you can always play with the height. I go as far to say it's probably one of the nicest engaged layouts we've had in the magazine for a really 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 long time. I'd actually put it. I'd put it as one of the top two. N-gauge layouts in the country and the other one isn't even finished yet so by default it's probably the best one that's out there at the moment 
And if anybody gets a chance to see it at a real show when uh, those happen again, it's well worth a trip to do so. I, I like James Street as well, though. Copenhagen Fields, obviously, being the other one. Yeah, Copenhagen Fields is not Engage House. If you say it's Engage, you'll get thrown <laughs> out. <laughs> I will get thrown out, but we all know it's two millimetres to the foot. Debbie, you have got 60 seconds starting now. So, uh, my choice for the show is the 009 layout by Jamie Warren called Sandy Shores. I've got a bit of a soft spot for, for this particular layout because, one, it's covered in sand which I love the beach and um, it's got some clever modeling in here. It's um, quite a small layout, but it manages to pack in a lot of detail. You've got the beach, you've got pond with the water details, you've got a little boat in there, um, you've got loads of wood and it's, it's just a really, really picturesque layout where there's kind of, it feels quite fun as well. Jamie's also a really, really talented modeler. He won our BRMA modeler of the year last time around. and um, yeah, it's just a it's just a really fun, uplifting layout. I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy it. The show spectacular. One thing I'd like to say about Jamie is that he blows the myth out of the water when you listen to people saying, "Oh, there's not enough young people in the hobby, or the hobby's doomed." Jamie has got such fantastic creativity. Uh, he started obviously sort of like through teenage years, and I can tell that there was a creative streak in him which didn't sort of like fit the norm. And it's brilliant to have seen that evolved over the years as well. Uh, and he really makes some captivating uh, scenes. And he goes way beyond the layout as well. He thinks about the presentation of everything. And he's such an engaging character. I think he's brilliant. He really is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are thinking that like young modellers are just obsessed about new releases or box opening and stuff. Like the amount of stuff that he's made on that layout... And like you say, the presentation, it's not a conventionally shaped layout. No. It is fun. It just packs so much in there. And it's interesting to look at. And he uses different techniques. You give him a, something out of the box and you say, have a go at building a diorama around this, and it'll be three, four times bigger than you ever expected it to be. You know, you'll have had, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll just chuck a duck pond in there. And whilst we're at it, there's a guy, you know, he's having a, see if there are any fish in it whilst we're at it. Let's have a little fisherman and, uh, oh, there's some reeds over here. And, you know. When, when we worked together on Sandy Shores, he, he submitted over and above what was asked for. And um, I decided to work with him on a couple more projects. So he he's, he's started to kind of do a couple of bits here and there, but his modeling is, is incredible for his age. He's, and his enthusiasm even more so. So yeah, it's, it's, he's great. Phil, no pressure. <laughs> You're doomed. <laughs> Your 60 seconds commences. <laughs> 60 seconds from now. Now, okay, prepare to be blown away. My pick is Beck and Scott, the model village. It's it's two acres. It's got 450 metres of track, so that stuff's all you lot. Um, it's older because it, it started in 1928 when uh, Roland Callingham was told by his wife to either get, the, get his model railway out of the house or she was leaving. So he went out into the garden, commissioned Bassett Lowe to build the most enormous gauge one, so bigger than all yours as well, garden railway. And it's still going today. It runs seven days a week. The trains run all day. Um, they'll cover in the region of two and a half thousand real miles every year. So just in terms of sheer scale, it wins out. And the cafe there does an excellent cake as well. What else do you want? Well, just just one question. Just what? Just one question. How much has this cost over the years? Because I saw a figure quoted on the website, which was absolutely mind blowing: five million pounds, I believe. It's worth every. It's worth every penny, it Howard. It, it makes yeah. money, Howard. It does. It, it makes does, money. It, does. it is fantastic, though. I remember going as a kid. Yeah, and... it's it's quintessentially British. It's um, it's it, it's got atmosphere, and it's probably the closest you get to visiting a real railway in the sense that you stand by the trackside just waiting for a train to come by and it just trundles through the scenery it's um mm. it's very unusual there are very few model villages left around and uh they do, they do an absolutely superb job there i mean i should have known that phil was going to choose the only one that was outdoors yeah <laughs> and of course, of course. As, as far as the virtual show goes it's the only time you get to see it at a show because quite frankly i did ask them if they'd let me let me dig it up and take it to uh, ali pally one year and they said no yeah, um, it would be. You know, it's. It's. I think that's the point of the virtual show. We can bring you things that you wouldn't normally see. Yeah. And uh, th this isn't. This isn't the only one. We we we're working on. You know, putting in things that you wouldn't get, normally get into an exhibition hall. You certainly wouldn't get all of these into an exhibition hall at the same time. And quite a few of them are built-in 
Well, they're in permanent place, aren't they, at home? We can do that. I mean, the great thing about it is we can go, we can go, and we can do that. Um, and I think you know, let's face it, we love going to real shows, but if you're going to have a virtual show, I think we've got to try and do something different with it. So when we were faced with the joys of trying to work out what this was going to look like, you know, we started with a blank canvas and uh, we've let our imaginations run riot and come up with something very different. Absolutely. I think a special mention needs to be made for Dent. And I'll tell you why. Northern, grimy, tall, drama. There are others. Beautiful. Beautiful as well. Very scenic. Beautiful. And also probably the one I want, most want to own. Right. But I think out of all the ones we've heard so far, I think it's got to be Sandy Shores. Ooh. Honestly. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the most different one, I think. And I know that Phil, I know, I know, I know. Yours is outdoors and stuff like that, but... I don't know. It, it's it, it's still like others I've seen. I don't. I can't think of any others that I know of like Sandy Shores. I think no. I think Sandy Shores um, ticks a lot of boxes for me. I I reckon when I go to a show, the layout I like is the one I want to build. It's not the one I want to own. It's never going to be the biggest one. And yet the first time I saw Jamie unpacking Sandy Shores when we did the R and Web Taunton Day, um, it blew me away. It was. I'd love to build that. I'd love to have the imagination, the artistry to be able to do what he's done. And so, yeah, yeah. And also, it's really annoying when someone younger than you does a really nice job. <laughs> that's that's what I find really irritating. I, I don't know. I love that uh, <laughs> possibility that the future is going to be better than the past, because too many people spend too long looking backwards and saying, "Oh, were you there when such and such happened? Did you queue for this? Mm. Did you buy issue zero mm. of uh, whatever?" And that's not going to build us sort of like a future looking backwards like that. No. And that's where I think that we need more Jamies out there. Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, beautifully presented as well. The way he's curved the back scene around on it. And well, you'll see it at the virtual show, won't you? Yeah. So having virtual exhibitions is a really great thing because I think I really miss the event of an exhibition, like anticipation, the excitement, and also variety. I think especially online, I tend to visit the same places over and over again, the same threads, and being presented something which you might not otherwise have gone for, I think is a really great thing. Strap yourself in, Corwin, because at this show, we are, we are doing the whole lot. We've got uh, model announcements. Um, we've got various pre forms of presentation, you know, the written word, we've got photographs, we've also got video um, practicals. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if it, we've only mentioned sort of our five favourite layouts there, but there are more than 20 to go at at the show. And I, I do think with all the scales covered, even Gauge 1, like Phil mentioned, there's something for all tastes. And uh, yeah, this is the first time, I believe, at a virtual exhibition, certainly for model railways, that model announcements will be made. So look out for those. Great. And leading on neatly from Sandy Shores, there's been a lot of 009 model announcements recently, so I'll be keeping an eagle eyes on those two. I think it's interesting because the, the numbers, the numbers if, you, if you talk to the 009 Society, the numbers that, that have joined in the last 18 months, two years, have been incredible. Um, and I think that's put down, I think that's down to the fact that you can buy some ready to run. So you've got the basis of a layout. But mm. um, yeah, I know the old hands are going, oh, it's terrible. I remember when I used to have to wrangle a white metal kit and stick it on a mini trick chassis that would explode after after a few, a few feet. You can still do that, but you can also get a layout running. It'll look pretty, and then you can, and then you can move on. And I think you know, the traditionalists are going to lose out a bit on that one, but um, there are going to be a lot more 009 layouts out there. It's, uh, it's definitely a coming scale. I agree. And also it shows that there was a latent demand for it. Mm. Anyway, I, I, someone was saying the other day, and it, it hadn't really struck me before, but why has no one done a ready-to-run Tarathen yet? Why why has it not happened yet? It's one of the most Give popular railways in the world. Uh, well, ten, oh, ten, and the Festinjog. Why is it taking so long for the Festinjog to run? Um, well, the, the problem, of course, you've got is that you've got a very is that the locos tend to be fairly specific. You know, there is only one Tarathen. Um, there are very few sort of um, batches of loco, narrow gauge locos. So. You know, every every one you produce is going to be very iconic. I mean, the L and B locos, for example, they are iconic to the L and B, and you didn't see them anywhere else. The Baldwin is a much better choice, and and of course there is technically a ready to run talent and It's just got a face on it. Razor Saw deals with that though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of the other aspects that uh, what's been produced so far in Double uh, O Nine ready to run 
is geared up towards passenger services. So I'm keen to see, obviously, what happens with uh, Backman's little low 4 uh, little Hansel. Fitting everything into there is really going to be a challenge for them. But they've got, obviously, a wide range of liveries to go at, uh, and it opens up the industrial side a bit more. We've seen an industrial explosion in 4 mil in double O, and I think that that's going to translate in double uh, O nine quite a lot too. And yeah. the opportunities for replacement bodies like chassis donors, that kind of thing. Mm. I think everybody's sort of rubbing their hands together looking at nice, nice outside framed chassis. Mm. I think like all these things, though, what it's going to do is it's going to expand the hobby. You know, you everybody everybody doesn't want to fly in Scotsman. A lot of people want, you know, a small industrial loco or something a bit different. And I think the, the hobby is big enough. I mean, people always say the hobby's shrinking. It's not. It's going the other way. The hobby is big enough that the guys, the ready-to-run guys, are now exploring all these, you know, smaller areas of the uh, of the prototype. Um, and that's uh, there is a latent demand in, in all of those. If, if they can make it economic, then... Um, you're going to find you're going to find all sorts of layouts, and that's the great thing about this hobby. There really is something for everybody, and you get a huge amount of variety. It's a broad church. If we can talk about real exhibitions for a moment, because I know that we are filling filling a well a desire amongst many railway models for meeting up in the social occasion and everything else like that. Mm. And I know that at a virtual exhibition, it's quite hard to be clouted mm. in the face with a rucksack. <laughs> um, so it's one thing I don't miss about a real exhibitions, but when we're allowed back into the wild again, what are you most looking forward to experiencing? From my point of view, it's the social interaction with the other modellers that are out there. Uh, however much we communicate online, as many people do, obviously, through RMWeb, it doesn't replace that face-to-face conversation that you can have with somebody. And you'll pick up on a little nugget that they actually say, and you say, oh, tell me more about that then. And you find out so much more about the people, their interests, their achievements, and what they're actually working on at the moment. And that's something that we just can't replace, uh, apart from people that we already know. And then obviously sort of like pick up the phone and say, oh, what are you working on, blah, blah, blah. And you pick up a bit of a feel there, but you can't then speak to those several hundred people that you do during the course of a weekend normally. So I think that's going to be... Um, a difficult one as to when that all sort of obviously starts to happen again. Uh, I think realistically we're going to be looking into uh, well into next year. But that's something that I'm really looking forward to. But I think exhibitions are going to change anyway, not just because of any restrictions or guidelines that we may have to work with it, but I think the balance of it will actually change maybe the age profile will change a little bit in terms of the exhibitors, the visitors, uh, and indeed the traders uh, that are at the shows. It's been a challenging year for a lot of people, but there are some traders who have done exceptionally well this year. Uh, First of all, with lockdown kicking in and everybody sort of like stocking up with as much as they can, through to obviously the niche cottage industry suppliers, Uh, that produce all of the bits and pieces that we need as modellers as well. And those guys have actually been snowed under for months on end now. And I think they will be for the next six months or so. So by the time the real exhibitions are out there again, these guys are probably dead on the ground overworked through the course of the, uh, the winter. So what we actually see when we walk back into an exhibition hall for the first time next year... I think it's going to be a bit different. I think that's what I'm looking forward to seeing as well. I think um, actually people's work because the lockdown period has enabled a lot of modelling to happen. Mm. You know, it's opened doors and given time to people that, you know, before they didn't have. And then we're going to see so many new layouts and um, not that you see the same layouts at every exhibition, but you do get some repeats. I think there's going to be some, they were going to be inundated with new stuff. It's going to be really, really good to see. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting. The virtual exhibitions, I hope, fills a hole. I mean, when we, when Ali Pali was cancelled, that was naturally the trigger for our first virtual exhibition. Yeah. And, you know, we were faced to in a situation where we had to think, OK, what do we want it to be? Now, we could have gone down a very static route where we just showed lots of content. We decided 
to make it really hard for ourselves, giving ourselves lots of stress and work, but also to make it a lot more engaging because we wanted people to feel involved. We wanted them to get a buzz like they would at a show. So we had like the live feed element, new content appearing sort of every every 10 to 15 minutes, you know, interviews, lots of, and it, people didn't know what to expect. Every, every five, 10 minutes, something new was coming, almost like how you would experience walking around an exhibition hall. Yeah, it really felt like a journey, like because it was being shown to you one at a time, it felt like a carefully curated schedule. It definitely did not feel like a carefully curated schedule, even like two days before. Definitely not. But not 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 from the back end anyway. No. When we were uploading stuff, quick, quick, we've got two minutes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was it was hard work. I mean, we've done it now. I'm, you know, the guys did. We all worked really hard together, and we did, regardless of the numbers, which were brilliant on the day. We we had a real successful weekend all all round. But I think, regardless of that, I think we would have been really proud of of what we what we managed to pull together in the end. So. This time round, happily, not so difficult. But uh, yeah, it's. I think. I think giving it that extra element, kind of, from from feedback, has bit was gave it some an edge and a bit more excitement, which people really loved. So excellent. Phil and Howard, what do you miss about real life exhibitions? Oh, cake and coffee for me every time. No, um, I, I really tell you what I really enjoy is um, most of the most of the exhibitions recently. I haven't been I haven't been behind the stand so much, but. When you are behind the stand and you get a reader that comes up and says, oh, I really enjoyed reading about such and such an article in the magazine. And then they'll present out of their, their bag a few photographs of something that they've been working on that you would, you know, because they've got that interaction with you, that face-to-face -face contact, ordinarily they'd never pick up the phone or get in touch with, you know, email or anything. But because you're there, oh, well, here's some pics. And actually, quite often, they're really good. And, and you well, OK, well, have you ever thought of having it in the magazine? Oh, I don't know if it's worthy of being, you know, in the magazine please you know let us let us know more about it um and and quite often you will find that you get the odd layout like that uh, just completely out of the blue it's, it's a home layout it's in the loft or it's in the garage and uh, and that's something that we've missed recently you know that that you don't tend to get so much um uh, but uh, i also i also enjoy you know the nipping around the manufacturer's stands because traditionally exhibitions are where you make a new model announcement um, and you get to actually hold and touch the 3D printed samples or the first DPs and, and actually get to, you know, a feel for the model rather than just seeing a static photograph uh, on a website. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm with Howard on this one that I, I enjoy it when I'm on the stand, either actually when I'm on a stand or when I've been behind a layout. The amount of times I've had mobile phones thrust into my face because they're showing that that's where people keep their photos. And, you know, people have gone through the photos of stuff, especially if it's based on one of the projects I've had in the magazine. That's been brilliant. But I think the other thing I miss is I miss I miss finding the unexpected. I miss wandering around and, and there's the sandy shores or some or the layout that I didn't that that quite simply I, I hadn't expected or I didn't know anything about. Or on some on some trade stand there is something, you know, probably some probably something hideously old that's that's well defunct. Um that that I turn up and go, oh, that's interesting. I could do something with that. And you know, internet shopping doesn't replace, I think, rooting around an interesting trade stand. Uh, the uh, yeah, you know, the I think, I'm thinking something like Anorax Anonymous. They they have a, a real feeding frenzy on the ends of their stand for that that boxes of stuff. Um, and also, I'm with Howard. I'm definitely missing the cake and the coffee. Not the, the cake and the tea, Howard. We're British. Uh, for them, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, there are there are certain events that just. Have, I think the other thing is that shows have an atmosphere. Every show is different. Yeah, uh, you know, Ali Pally has a, has a different atmosphere to Peterborough, which has a different atmosphere, for example, to something like Wick Rail um, or yeah, York. And I think every one of them is different. You meet different people. You see different. So you see very often, even though even though some of the things like a travelling circus, you see the same the same traders or that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, the approach is always very, very different. And uh, that's, I think that's part of the fun of it. And also trying to get a deal, I think is quite fun when, you, when you're when you talking to traders. It's like, well, if I get this in this, can I get this for free? It's very hard to do on online because you always just have to type it out or you have to go through an automated system to do it. But you can just sort of be a bit cheeky sometimes and just say, can you just throw this in, please? Well, somebody actually said to me recently that they missed being insulted by certain traders when they did try and strike a bargain. Really? 
Not going to mention any names. <laughs> I, I think you, yeah. I think I think you also casually pick stuff up. There's a there's a lot of impulse buying at shows, which you don't which you don't tend to do online. Um, I've wandered around shows and picked up stuff that I've never, I've yeah, I've never known. Um, they they people do laugh at me at that uh, the stand, or at least Andy York laughs at me when I come back from 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 a wander around. We should see some of the stuffy. <laughs> yeah. um, I think was it was it Doncaster? I came back with a monorail that I found on a stand. Well, yeah, but also looking at your blog as well, there's a whole host of he's not really bought that as he uh, things that we don't even see in the magazine. So Phil's own workbench blog is worth a look and a laugh sometimes for the weird. Yeah, they won't let me put all the stuff I build in the magazine. I have to. I'm only allowed sensible stuff in there. It's not. It's not. They're no fun, really. Oh, I let you have a little bit of craziness. <laughs> oh, you haven't looked at what I've just sent over to you for the uh, for the next issue. <laughs> oh, Phil, Phil, I've got to say I can't believe what you've done for the November issue in that bonfire. Yeah, just a, just a quick one on this. Is that me? Am I right in thinking that that is a figure of <laughs> yeah. me? With arms cut off and some mangled <laughs> legs fitted to the bottom of it. He's, he's finally realised. No, I, I was looking. I was looking at that a couple of I weeks ago. I never gave it away, admit. Phil. I never told him. No, never no, because you, you didn't realise. <laughs> I did Ruth it. spotted it immediately. Amazingly, our designer Ruth. She she, she spotted did. it immediately. But you know, well, you know how it is. You, you're in a rush to do a project, and you're looking for a figure to sit on top of a bonfire. And yeah. You've got loads and Absolutely. loads of three D printed team members, and Andy and I are both yeah. punched up with things, so we won't work. And and yeah. so there's only one candidate. You had no choice. No, I know. We've all yeah. been there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right for going on holiday. Talk about exhibition tactics. Um, how do you usually navigate a show? Do you usually go straight for the thing that you came to see? Do you do a recce around the whole thing first? How do you work your way around a show? I suppose for me, uh, one of our own events or the other events that I sneak into that's uh, probably a bit naughty, that I get uh, a bit of an advance peek at what the interesting things are. Perks of the job. So I try and then, obviously, yeah, just uh, hold on to those things for early Sunday morning to go and take a quiet look round and have a look at something that's different, as uh, Phil had referred to earlier. And that's one of the reasons why I like Wally Show and kept on going as a, as a punter, uh, before being in this job and that was to go and see the things that had come from overseas because you actually got a lot from Dutch and Scandinavian modelers come over that you wouldn't see at any other shows and it was different you've got people replicating Dutch master paintings with working railways in them and so on and other such madness and those are the things that uh, really take you back and you want to spend a bit of time on so I mean for me the shopping and the bargains you can go and do those uh, any time I want to soak in what's different. I'd be honest. When I'm a paying punter, um, I will, I, I will go straight to the yeah. cake. No, no. I got, gosh, no, not first thing. No, no, that'd be wrong. That'd be rude. Leave, leave that for at least an hour and a half, and then work it. Then work over the cake. Um, the uh, no, so straight for the second hand stall, I think, because um, and then I'm not rooting through the ready to run stuff. I'm rooting through the junk boxes at the end where I'll find some weird kits and that sort of thing. If I'm if I'm working a show, as Andy says, we get the opportunity to walk around and have a look at stuff. I usually take my camera with me and just go snapping details. I'm again, I'm never snapping trains. I'm always snapping the details and the interesting cameos and that sort of thing on layouts because those are the bits that are inspiring me and I can get at them without having to force my way through um, through loads of rucksacks. Tell you what, I mean, you've said what uh, what we do like at shows. Come on then, Corwin. What really grinds you gears at the show? <laughs> well, not something that annoys me, but something I did want to talk about was uh, it's a problem that I actually made a thread about on RM Web, which is a problem that I have, especially when you're the only person watching a layout and you, I... I have a thing in my head where I feel like I have to say something like like there's a an anxiety it's like say something speak to the person you're standing in front of someone you've got to speak to them you've got to say something and the only ones that I don't find that with are ones with leaning bars because we had these at the Bristol show where if you can just lean on something and just say I'm just here to watch it I just want to watch you play with your trains that is something that I really like but actually we might see more of that I guess with um coronavirus restrictions and things like that somewhere to actually lean that's like a safe distance from the operator and the layout i i find that the most stressful part of an exhibition is being in front of something and not knowing what to say even if you like it i just i just just want to stand in silence and watch it sometimes yeah it's not essentially what annoys me um when exhibiting 
Um, I do find having to have that confrontation with people about touching stuff. That's that's the thing that I just don't know if there's any real way around because everybody wants to touch it. They want to like see what it's made of and stuff like that. And they don't maybe don't know that they're not supposed to touch it. And I hate being that person who says, please don't touch it. Or, uh, I mean, there's some people who might slap the hand away. But I don't know if there's any good tactics for that. Oh, you've got a ready-made excuse now. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, find, I find sometimes... It depends on the layout operator, because if it's a small, compact layout, like the one you mentioned, you know, you stood in front of it, there's just you, the guy operating it. If they've got the chair to the front of the layout, quite often that's a lot easier to have a conversation with them because you're right next to them than it is if they're hidden behind a back scene with a, uh, you, you know, all sort of tucked away and you can't really see them and it looks like they're busy. You sort of feel like you're interrupting them if they're trying to, to work on something. And quite often with these layouts, it's not always going to plan. You know, something's derailed or yeah, there's the time to, to pick your moment to start the conversation, isn't there? So you don't cheer when um, something derails, for example? I've never, no, not, not, not knowingly cheer. The model row equivalent of in a <laughs> um, bar when somebody drops a glass, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool, no. cool win. It, general guide, um, if, if the operator is holding a soldering iron in the hand, shut up. <laughs> that means, but yeah, it's usually that's a sign. Um, not going to it, it's about that. That's a sign they do not wish to talk to you. They do not. They, they they just want you to go away, and they do not want your advice at all. They just want to crack on and Noted. fix stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, I'll be honest. I, when I'm behind a layout, when I've taken, when I've exhibited layouts, I get bored operating layouts. So I really go for the chat. I really enjoy talking to people, and. Uh, my joy as an operator is is actually it's about Saturday lunchtime when all the normal people arrive because Saturday morning at shows is usually grumpy old men leaning and scowling at things, um, and then is that what grinds your gears for? Is it are we getting to the well to the number? No, the, the one that the one that really annoys me uh, and is and also a bit of mischief in me is when they stand there they won't talk to the guy behind the layout, but they'll tell their mate how you've done something and get it wrong, but they forget the fact that you're only two feet away from them, you can hear them, and you'll go, oh, mm. actually, what I did was, and um, they they really do get grumpy at that one, but it's just, yeah. but I'll tell you what, once you get, once, I mean, Andy was talking about going around on Sunday, it's a lot quieter, it is, and you meet such a wide variety of people, you meet all the people who don't know the proper way, in inverted commas, to do something, and God, you don't have to get some inspiration out of that, because they don't, they don't know the right way of doing it, they just come up with a way of doing it, and so it's, mm. you know, I never, I always say to people, you don't get your value for money out of a show if you don't talk to the people behind the layout. If, if there's a question, ask it. Don't ever be afraid not, uh, don't ever be afraid to ask. Mm. Also, there's another one that, I mean, obviously Phil's referred there to this audio barrier that there is between exhibitor and uh, visitor. I mean, obviously as an exhibitor t uh, too, that you might engage somebody in conversation whilst they're standing there. And they don't reply. You think, okay, well, um, <laughs> maybe the maybe the visitor does have hearing difficulties, mm. but he'll then talk to his mate next to him, as Phil said, and you think, hang on, no, you haven't got any hearing impairment. You're just rude <laughs> off. Yeah. Two things for me, and you mentioned a little bit about it before then, Corwin. When you're perhaps because quite often at layout uh, you have a, uh, a barrier in front won't you it's conveniently positioned to stick one the bottom foot at the bottom rung lean a over adopt the top the position and you yes. can yeah adopt the, the 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 position as you call it and and you just get the right viewing height for the layout and it's quite comfy and then somebody will rock up they've got four or five meters to the left four or five meters to the right where they could position themselves they choose to go right next to you and then they'll stick an ipad in yes. oh, yeah. as well. and the second one for me is and I, I know we've all been hiding it, but it's personal hygiene. You don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> I didn't from. want to go there. <laughs> just, <laughs> well, I'm going to. I'm going there. I am going there, and I can see you all keep cringing. It light, but right? I, I'm going to keep it light. Yes, but you don't know where it's coming from. But it is splitting atoms. <laughs> on that. On, on that note, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I like barriers. I like barriers at layouts. I I don't like doing a show if I'm taking my own layout. I don't like doing a show without a barrier, but I just think it makes everybody feel a lot more comfortable. You've got something to lean on. You've got something to grab hold of. And as a as an ex again with your own layout, there you you just don't want people grabbing hold of that edge of the layout because mm. you can see some of them. They've got like half an inch half an inch along the front of the baseboard. It's all worn away with people's with with, with people's fingers. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, it's, it's so tempting though. I think when you you want to be able to sort of lean into it and to have that thing there to lean on that's specifically there helps so much. I think. I, I think it is. Um, we had a layout featured in the magazine a couple of issues ago, which said which had a sign on it that says "No finger poking." There's actually some layouts out there with mock electric fences across. I was the front. just going to say. Electric fence, that's all you need. Oh, are they yeah. supposed to be mock? We Nobody real. told me they weren't supposed to be mock. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me, I think uh, I think the worst the worst thing for me about shows is the parking charges. <laughs> oh no, no, nothing, no, 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 you don't, don't, don't go there. I mean that. it's it's funny because you do you do I mean you say lots of people have different ways of approaching shows. The show experience is more than just wandering around the hall looking for the cheapest ready to run. It's it's a whole bag of things. And I think again, I think this is why I like model railway shows, because there really is something for everybody, and everybody gets a different thing out of it. And you just have to accept that everybody's everybody's approach and everybody's interest is different. And uh, you know, that's that's the strength of, of, of what we do. And I say I certainly am looking forward to getting real shows back again. Absolutely, mm. yeah. Um so for you guys, what makes a great exhibition layout for you? Because I know we've talked about our favourite ones in this show, the virtual show, but in in the real world, what makes a great exhibition layout? Is it spectacle or is it operational interest or is it detail or is it the operator themselves? For me, it's the overall scene that somebody set. That tells me that they're an artist as much as a modeler or engineer. And that's the thing, I think, which sets them apart from whether it be, yeah, they've built all of their locos out of sort of like brass and they've smelted their own iron for (laughs) making the track work and so on. Uh, For me, it's capturing atmosphere and creativity. And those are the ones that will win for me. I agree with that, yeah. I, I, I can't argue with that. I think create I think uh, it is all about storytelling and it is about, you know, kind of capturing a moment in time that can be a memory or it can be a dream, but it's or a nightmare in some cases. <laughs> but it's it's about capturing that moment and sort of taking everyone with you on that journey. I also like a bit of quirky, I've gotta say. I'm I'm always drawn to something that's a little bit a little bit different as well yeah i think i, I think i said I, I want to go away having seen at least one layout that i want to go and build that i'm that i actually really feel i want to go and build that is i mean again for me it's never going to be the big layout with the express trains running through that's not really my bag but i know for other people that's that's exactly what they want to do they want they just want to stand by the line side watching the trains go by and uh you know if if you can insp- i mean i can be just inspired by one of these tiny little micro layouts as a, a, a as one of the huge layouts I think that's something I do look forward to exhibitions is a huge layout though because of the space that I'm working in you know I've got quite a small room I don't have the space to watch the trains go by or have a roundy roundy or anything else or even a layout at the moment um but I really like to be able to go and see a huge train whiz by and you can watch it disappear into the distance which you just can't do at home it it just gives you an opportunity to experience something you just can't have uh, one thing when uh, it does actually appear out there in the real world is uh, Simon's Heat and Lodge Junction that fits that bill call. And that'll just blow your mind when you see that. 145 foot long, I think it is, this scene. Uh, and when you stand at one end of it, even though it's O-gauge, you can't even tell if the train's moving at the other end. You can probably hear it, but you won't do it in an exhibition hall. Uh, but whilst you're down there in the basement with it, all that you can do, you can hear this loco, and you do need a set of binoculars <laughs> to see this thing coming. And there is no other layer that will have that uh, experience that you you have by standing by the line side, which is what Simon wanted to do, was to uh, recreate his teenage years loafing by the line side. Yeah. It's going to be really impressive when that emerges. Can't wait to see it. Uh... Yeah, that's, it sounds incredible. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned about uh, composition of scene, I think is really important. There was one that I saw recently that every individual aspect of the modelling was fantastic, but everything was arranged at right angles and, and there were just no curves or blending. It, it seemed like a lot of very good models kind of arranged in a really organised fashion. And it did just strike me as being a bit odd when you step back and you see it. It's like, that it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like a scene. Yeah, I think that that you're saying there about right angles is a byproduct of 
having your modelling dictated by products that are on the marketplace as opposed to creating it uh, you, if for yourself or all going out into the real world and looking at how everything fits together in a landscape or an urban environment that, yeah, you might have streets of terraced houses, but there's an awful lot of other stuff going on there, which is incidental detail, and it breaks up all of that repetition and right angles that you say. Uh, so a big advocate of uh, people modelling the real world rather than uh, filling the baseboards with product. I think forced, forced perspective is going to become really important, isn't it? Or it's yeah. becoming more so. And depth, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I, I mean, I love a bit of depth, depth and height. Mm. I, I tend to, I, I, and I did pick Scorbiton before for that, one of those reasons is that the depth of the baseboard to me, I just, I just find it, it helps lead your eye down a scene. You look at the town there, on Scorbiton and your, your eye is led from the foreground all the way up the hill to the church on the very top and it's never bored at any point there's always something to pick out if you've got a layout that's very very restricted in sort of you know with maybe you're working with a foot or 18 inches you're relying a lot on that back scene you haven't got as much going on in, in the depth of the layout to, to keep the eye, the eye entertained that's not possible with every layout and again it comes back to what, what scale do you choose you know something that's great at 11 foot by six foot in uh, in double o gauge could that be even better in n gauge could you then have a railway more in the landscape than than say in double o gauge you know and I, I think some, some of the layouts that we're seeing come on the scene now we're getting people who are if you i always feel a good layout sign of a good layout is that you feel like you're being immersed into that scene uh, you can really set the tone you've got more and more features going on in, in, as, as your eye goes to the back scene that, that sort of say, well, okay, we're in the 70s now. I can see there's this going on, there's that going on. Little little cues. It's not overly forced down your face, you know, like, uh, oh, it's got to be this particular car because that was often seen in that colour in the 70s. Just little quirks, you know. Um, maybe there aren't as many cars on the layout. Uh, maybe maybe we're, you know, the, ho the old horse and cart. or Just little cameos that can set it off that are, that are quite nice. And, um, yeah. There's a there's a lovely layout in uh, the current issue of um, BRM actually, which has some great figure work at St Ives. Mm. Lots of uh, people around the beach and paddling in the sea and 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 it's it's set it uses some really clever clever modelling as well, um, using Photoshop and using a drone at some point I think to take a picture of the sea. It's, it's you know so so much technology now that's got enabling modelers to really take their layouts yeah. to the next level. I mean you quote St Ives there Debbie it's a fantastic layout especially if you look at it that that is the first serious layout that the guys have, uh, ever made and he's mm. looked at it obviously with a bit of lateral thinking of thinking well how do you recreate that landscape which is what he remembered from his childhood and obviously went back to the site and how do I actually uh, make it feel like St Ives, not just sort of like a, rail, uh, a model of the railway at St Ives. Uh, and also as well, I've got to say, he did a fantastic bit of video showing us uh, how everything ran on the layout mm. as well as uh, his own pictures as well. So, I mean, Paul did a fantastic job with that article overall. Yeah, he did. Something you said, Debbie, about... Um forced perspective as well because i know that i talked a lot about scale and and being able to see into the distance but actually being able to fake seeing into the distance probably just as important there was a really amazing like an animated diorama i remember seeing a while ago that I had i think it was maybe a, a g scale tram in the foreground that would disappear and then be replaced by an o scale one and then a double o one and then an n and then a z one as it sort of disappeared into the mountains in the background that that was at that was at Worley a couple of years ago that was uh, one of the foreign layouts nice, really interesting yeah. box shape design and yes i remember i remember that one it was uh, i mean it was a little bit of a gimmick in a way in that you know, obviously you've got yeah. lots of so identical that's why I say animated diorama but yeah yeah it it was it had a crown around it it was amazing to watch and you know some very very clever work. Yeah, and, and that's the, that's the key word there, clever. I think forced perspective seems easy to some people, like it, it sounds quite easy, but actually to do it well, um, sometimes it's very easy to get wrong. It is very easy. It can be very obvious, and that can ruin a layout. It can, you can look at it and it just automatically, it's yeah, that doesn't work. One of the layouts that uh, does that really well in the virtual show is uh, Ealing Road, the uh, Missenden modellers. 
uh, and they applied a lot of technology to it to actually plan out this forced perspective. And when you look at the, the rows of terraced houses going back, and that scene is only about sort of like, like two and a half to three foot deep. But like Copenhagen Fields, it looks as though you're looking a mile into the distance on those baseboards. And you'd refer to that, Corwin, about extending the environment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just that feeling of immersion that you get with that. I think this is, this is back to what we were talking about with something like Jamie Warren, where it's about as much about art as anything else. You know, you're, you're, you're painting a 3D picture for people and... That's a you know it's there's 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 so many aspects to what we do where you know you can start off with your with, with cutting bits of wood to make a baseboard and then you're wiring things up and you, and by and uh, choosing your trains and all that sort of thing but ultimately the really great layouts there is always a hint of of, of the artist in there and uh, that I think that's what makes it accessible to a lot of people who who simply don't want to get hung up on the engineering doesn't matter what what you what track gauge you're doing. Um, mm. Crack on, crack on, and, and make something beautiful. And also, I don't think I, mean, I completely agree with what Phil's saying. And but also, I think that some people it doesn't have to be about a creation of a, a piece of art, but but equally about recreating a memory. Because some people really care about a time in their childhood or um, a really poignant moment in their life. Then, then that is what becomes their driver to making sure that they can do it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they make the best layouts as well. Exhibitions and clubs are both main social events of the hobby. Club nights are really important for some people. And having dates in the diary give people things to work towards. Uh, how have you seen people adapt to staying motivated during lockdown and not having those deadlines or social meetups? I think that the social media aspect, I mean, we've seen so much more activity on RM web particularly in the uh, the early stages of lockdown where people piling into projects. And that was great that they're doing it for themselves, not just to actually achieve something, but also as a way of managing their little world and situation that we've all been going through. Uh, so obviously on that side, that a lot of people have been creating their own goals to keep themselves going not because of an exhibition, not because of a deadline, because we don't know what those deadlines are at the moment. So it's been for the benefit of the individual, which I think is a good thing. Mm. I think for a lot of people, the hobby has, has, has been very beneficial during lockdown. And, uh, you know, at the moment, a lot of regions are still under tighter social restrictions. Uh, and quite often, railway modelling isn't there a sole hobby. You know, there's lots of people that are uh, into you know they'll have other things, other activities, leisure pursuits. They might be into golf. They might uh, they might be into car rallies or you know you name it. Uh, going down to your local heritage railway, for instance, none of that's been possible. And so that time that they would have spent doing other activities is now being focused on on the hobby because you can. It's one of those hobbies you can do it at home. You can you can order stuff online if you want. You can go on RM Web and chat with your mates. And uh, it's something. It's one of those hobbies that can be. It can be continued to an extent, you know, if, if, you've, if you've got the access to the products. I think everybody's just had to adapt. It's just one of those things. Like, you know, within the modelling industry, you could, you could say that there's a, there is a little bit of lag behind other hobbies um, in terms of, like, online and, and, and different technologies. But like everything in life, you know, lockdown has forced a lot of people to kind of take up new ways of doing things. And whether that's online shopping for the first time or um, learning a new skill, or like I said, just um, embracing social media, Zoom, and you know whatever else um, you know it throws at you. And I think um, I think it's people just got on with it, like you know that because what other choice do we have? If you want to stay in touch with modeling folk, if you want to do exhibitions, if you want to do you know want to get in touch with like-minded people, they're they, they, they need to get on board with the virtual life, I guess. Can I be controversial at a moment and actually say that I think it's probably not made that much difference to the majority of the people in the hobby. We, we fixate on exhibitions and they do tend to be the, the thing that everybody looks at. But actually, most people are sitting at home with their layout quite happily, building away, doing this. They haven't got a deadline in the same way. There's not an exhibition looming for them because they've no intention of taking the layout out to an exhibition. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I think what's happened is that they, they've, in certain cases, they've found more time, which is great. They've probably, I know some who found members of the family showing more interest 
but um, ultimately, that's the great thing of you, for a lot of people. It's it's just something. It's just something I do, and I'll I enjoy as much or as little of my spare time put into it as uh, as, as as is available. Yeah, I was going to say another uh, element of it, which concerns me a bit, that we've talked about the people that stay in contact uh, via social media, etc. But a lot of the people that can't go to the clubs, can't go to shows, they may not have that uh, interaction and that support uh, that they've been used to over the years. Uh, And there's a lot of people out there that we don't know how they are and how they're getting on and what they're actually doing. And that's a bit of a difficult one. I mean, we can't solve it. But I think at least we can say that we're mindful of it, that there are some people within the hobby that have probably, I don't know, it's been a heavy situation for everybody this year. And I think we've got to be mindful of those people about sort of like, yeah, how do they feel? And for them, it'll be great when we can get back to a bit of normality. I think that some clubs have actually moved over to doing weekly Zoom calls as well, just like we're doing now, uh, in order to just stay in touch and to, to avoid like losing people. I think as well, I think a lot of people were really good when lockdown first happened. Um, and it's, I suppose, you know, everyone was doing Joe Wicks exercises every day, oh, and doing yeah. this, that and the other. And I think it was, it's a case of trying to find something that is, you know, is, is something that you can maintain. I think it's kind of, Zoom's really easy. I think the unknown is what's scary, I think, once you start doing it. How do we avoid despondency? If we're not getting that social fix or, you know, we're talking about the face to face and and things like that. How what would our advice to modelers be to avoid despondency and to keep motivated about carrying on with your projects? First of all, I'd say take that pressure off yourself that you're actually creating for whatever reason, whether it actually relates to the project that you're doing. It's not life or death. You can take it at your own pace. Step back from it. Reassess what you actually want out of it. Do some smaller projects as well so you've got a feeling of achievements of uh, maybe some smaller aspects of it. Uh, But also as well, I mean, think about the rest of your life as as well, sort of like uh, whether you've got good stuff or tough stuff that's actually going on. Talking to uh, a modelling friend yesterday, he was a bit down about a few things, but I said to him, I said, okay, break it down. What is it actually stopping you doing that you have to do? Well, nothing really. Uh, I haven't been able to go to the pub and have a beer with you. Yeah, well, that's no great loss, mate, is it? So uh, uh, there's ways around it and talking about it. Uh, I think if people have got somebody that they can talk to, we've seen a lot said about that last year. And RMWeb is actually a supportive community as well, where the, where the people have got everyday concerns, stupid questions, or they just want to unload a bit. The RM Web is actually a place for that, that community too. And that's where we've had that thread where you can share what you've been up to uh, during the lockdown period and, and what you're up to and, and get a bit of motivation and encouragement from others because it's quite easy to get wrapped up in your project. And sometimes when you get a few encouraging comments from like minded folks, you know, oh, okay, other people like this, you know. All right, okay, I'll have another go, do, do a bit more on it, and, and then you get that positive feedback. And it sort of eggs you on to, 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 to see that final picture because your final vision of a, of a large layout completed or even a little small cameo, it's not just done by clicking your fingers. It, it does take a lot, of, a lot of hours. That's why we call it a pastime. It certainly passes time, and time is something that a lot of people have had a lot of recently. I think, like Andy said as well, I think um, it, it, you know, modelers can get really wrapped up in what they're doing put themselves under a lot of pressure but ultimately this is a hobby and that is what it's supposed to be it's supposed to be fun um and you know you're supposed to enjoy what you're doing so i think um you know i think the most, most important thing is is that people get that out of it that they have to get absolutely enjoyment. Yeah. Well, it's all right saying that. But how many <laughs> magazines a month are we churning? Well, I wasn't. We, we, a few we, as a team, there. we as a team take it very, very seriously. But um, yeah, but for the readership. So everyone, bar Phil Parker, Andy Fork, and Howard Smith, <laughs> and myself, should be enjoying the hobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here it's serious, serious business. All oh, right, is is speaking oh, of which, did anybody tell me that one? When it was it supposed to be serious? <laughs> <laughs> What's next for World of Railways? Well, I mean, there's lots of plans afoot at the moment. Um, not a lot that I can really 
talk about too much but um <laughs> basically it's going to be widening its net i mean i think i think the world of railways is is a great website and we've come a long way um into trying to make it a really good tool and a really good um really good for the end user um and really i think what what people can expect to see is is for the content and the areas to evolve into different areas of of railways i think that's probably where we're going to see um i've been speaking to some just some some great um people who's going to hopefully be contributing in the near future as well and 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 um a little bit more video um a little bit more of this and that it's just going to keep growing we want it to become the definitive resource really for the and, and we want it to actually be representative of what it is it's world of railways so we need to make sure that the content lives up for that. One of the uh, the elements of World of Railways, which I think is really important, is the news and communicating that out there. Because with so many manufacturers, so many new entrants, including yourself, Corwin, obviously we're on uh, Railway Mania products that you're bringing in, to try and keep up with what's happening out there in the marketplace at the moment is a nightmare these days. Mm. So on World of Railways, you've got a steady feed of news items each and every day where we're keeping on top of the uh, the news as it comes through, and particularly Howard and Phil are actually posting that content up there with a bit of a summary for you. So it is somewhere that's worth visiting on a daily basis. Absolutely. One, one to bookmark. Certainly. I think also it's it's important that a big chunk of this hobby is the cottage industry manufacturers. It's the little guys. Yeah, we, we all know about the Hornbys, the Backmans, the Helgens, that sort of thing. Um, but there are all sorts of little guys out there doing really interesting work. And one of the things World of Railways does is it supports that industry. You know, we, we're really behind the whole model railway industry. And so we will happily, we, we'll happily report on somebody who's done some particularly interesting um, drain pipes or you know, or, or or wagon loads or something like that, just as much as we'll pick up somebody who's made um, a nice new, or is announcing a nice shiny new locomotive, because that there's mm-hmm. so many aspects to that hobby that as I say there's only so many pages you can fit in a magazine. But we will go. We we do our best. If if somebody gets in touch with us and they are making, um, I don't know, a new door handle for a carriage range or something like that, we we'll yeah we'll we'll do something with it and. Uh, yeah, we'll try and make we'll try and help them out as well. Club news as well. Don't forget, we, we we're all there for supporting clubs. Um, you know, they're one of the backbones of the hobby. And uh, if if ever any of you have got anything to to send that you'd like to see posted on World of Railways, then uh, feel free to take a few pictures and and send us a bit of text describing uh, what you're up to and and what it is you'd like to release uh, to brm at warnersgroup.co.uk, and uh, we'll be in touch and let you know uh, what we can do. I just have one thing I wanted to finish on, which was another timed debate, which I've sprung on you. This one is Andy versus Phil. Phil, <laughs> Phil, you're at an exhibition. You've got, you've got your prize layout. What couplings are best to use and why? You've got 30 seconds starting now. Spratt and Winkle Mark 1. It's um, it's uh, very very difficult to see. It's very robust, and so the wagons come out of the uh, out of the stock box, all ready to use. Little tweak my fingers, maybe, but essentially I can put them on the layout. They'll work perfectly, and it means I can go and get a cup of tea. And they're about ninety percent reliable. Spot on, Andy. Why is Phil wrong? You've got thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's got to spend no. all the time. Making up those Spratt and Winkles when he could have been uh, drinking tea and having a cake anyway. So uh, that's argument one anyway. However, I'd go for three links for accuracy or an adaptation of the old tension locks with the Kirby uncoupling, which is basically adding a staple and some neodymium magnets for remote operation. Dead simple sweet rather than having to waste time making stuff. I'd, I'd, I'd actually, I, it depends what scale you're working in. I mean, you said three links there, but that's not going to work for many end gauge uh, or two millimeter to the foot scale modelers. Yeah, but Seven I don't mil model models. End gauge. Ah, um, but you if don't they're proper, if they're proper do. hardcore, they'll use three links. Yeah, well, we'll talk <laughs> <about> <laughs> All right, Howard. Howard, if you want to throw a wild card in, you've got thirty seconds now. Okay, right. So, so okay, right. Seven millimeter to the foot. I'll stop it, off, Lynn. I I'm going to say it depends on the type of layout. If it's a shunting layout, you're not going to want to go down the three link route. Yeah. It's, it's going to be too now. much faff. You want to have something like Phil suggested, the Spratter Winkles. Um, four mil, probably hook and loop. That would be a Spratt and Winkle then? No, just bent wire. 
and and the usual solder against the uh, the buff the buffers there. That's time. Uh, a little bit more discreet. It's Howard, that's the second um, time you've gone over time. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm bending Honestly, the rules. That, that's, that, that's, you never that's does how, anything on time. I was going to say what's, that's what's, how what's, on deadline. That, that's oh, fine. Yeah. What, <laughs> what's the point in having rules if you can't just flex them a bit? And <laughs> okay, well, I think that's a good place to wrap up then. Thanks very much for coming on the podcast, everybody. Uh, really appreciate the that's first okay. remote recording we've done. Hopefully, it went well. I'm going to find out after. Well, I'll tell you what, you've been absolutely brilliant, you Corwin. Have, you I love have. what yeah. you do as well. Uh, not just with the initiative that you've uh, taken of doing podcasts within the oh. hobby, uh, but also your own creativity with the products that you're bringing into the Railway Mania brand, whether it's from a simple uh, ruler through to uh, the loco bodies. All power to you. Well done. Thanks very yeah. much. And you, and you can pay Andy York his uh, yeah. 20 quid. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's the usual account, yes. isn't it? The Swiss one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, if you're listening to this during the first week, I'd like to welcome everyone to the official opening on Saturday, November the 7th at 9.30am for two days of fantastic model railway entertainment and exciting new announcements. If you're from the future and November the 8th, 2020 has been and gone, please be sure to check out the World of Railways website for more upcoming features. Thanks again to Debbie, Howard, Phil and Andy for coming on the show, and thank you for listening. (laughs) 